All right, there's quite a few interesting news articles. Uh, the post office is apparently going broke, and um, I thought it was just an oversight that they forgot to fund it, but it is not an oversight. This is one of Trump's beliefs. A Trump believes that the reason the post office is going broke is that they're delivering all those Amazon packages and not charging enough for them. And he has a huge contempt and hatred of Amazon because it's owned by Bezos, who runs the Washington Post, who is a political enemy. So he absolutely refuses to let them bail out the post office, which is, of course, going broke because nobody is mailing packages. There are prime, I guess some people are, not, not as much as they, as usual, apparently although I might have thought the opposite. But anyway, they've always been in a lot of trouble. And Trump refuses to bail them out. He says they should just charge Amazon more. So we will see what comes of that. Given the age of the text, have anything to do with the level of difficulty? Um, well, uh, Deborah's asking about the Windows chapter. Actually, the age of the text makes it easier because Windows has added even more complicated stuff on top of all that in the later versions. <laughs> so it is... Uh, as you've noticed, I think in Chapter 8, Windows has many, many security features, and they keep adding more and more and more. Windows is really a leader in this because they're the ones that get attacked so much. So uh, everything that is simple in Linux is very complicated in Windows with many layers of uh, security patches on top of it. And I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. So I looked up this thing, the Semantic Web Gateway. I couldn't even figure out if it's hardware or software. I think it's probably both. It comes from IBM, and it's got a remote code execution exploit, apparently. It looks very simple. Um, all you have to do is go to a PHP script, and then you can write, uh, apparently, PHP here. Um, you can open a shell in PHP and then run it. So I think he found uh, just the way usual uh, uh, file upload vulnerability. So it sounds pretty simple. And, um, but anyway, hopefully they will patch that. So um, I was very pleased. You know, I went past a hospital recently. There was almost nobody around. There were not a lot of traffic. It looks to me like very few people are getting sick in San Francisco. And that is certainly true compared to New York. And um, I thought it was because we shut down sooner. But I think we only shut down five days sooner. So people are saying it's probably just luck. What happened is we shut down before St. Patrick's Day and New York shut down after St. Patrick's Day. So they had huge parties before the shutdown and that spread the virus. And they say that's, you know, we, it is because we shut down earlier, but in a way it's just luck. And several of the places with really big outbreaks, it's all due to one event, like one party or one church service where a whole lot of people got infected. And if you could have prevented that one event from happening, you would have saved a lot of lives. I'm very impressed by this. A bunch of people are hating on Zoom lately. Everybody says Zoom is um, is insecure, whereas the security problems they're finding are not impressing me very much, and I'm not convinced to quit using it. But it might apply to people like military or government leaders that need a higher level of security. But Zoom also said they're not going to have any new features for 90 days. They've frozen everything just to fix all the security problems. And I'm impressed by this kind of stuff. So this guy... Zoom had a vulnerability where you could post a URL in the chat and you could make it a local path leading to a file share on a Windows machine. And if somebody clicked it, it would then connect to that share and send their Windows hashed credentials to it. So, and they said, why did that happen? Anyway, they said that, so that was, that was actually not an incredibly impressive vulnerability in my opinion, but anyway, this guy went and figured it out and found out why it happened because Zoom did try to write code to prevent that, but they used a Microsoft product and the Microsoft product um, hard-coded a check for that and let it through. So he figured out why. And so after he tweeted this, Zoom offered him a job and he's going to work at Zoom. And I'm impressed by that. Now, when I was young in the world of security, I would rage at people and say, how stupid are they? And I'm, uh, several years ago, I had, went through a forensics textbook and they made a mistake that I thought was terrible. And I was actually partway through writing the email. How could you be so stupid? How could you get this wrong? And I said, well, you know, I'm not going to get any good out of being that way. So I wrote a very gentle, very polite message saying, this confuses me. I don't think this is right. It, shouldn't it be like this? And the guy offered me a job. You know, it's, there's, there's a lot to be said here. If you, if you don't come off too hostile, a good company will reward you for being nice to them. And I'm, I think this is the right thing to do. That's why a lot of people are mad at Zoom, but I'm not really. They have security problems like everybody does. And when they get pointed out, 
they try and fix them in a hurry, like everybody, like good companies do. And this is the right thing. Instead of like lying and saying there's no problem or suing you or something, they treat you good if you tell them their problems. Huh? That's not bad. However, of course, for U.S. military use, they probably don't want to use it because apparently the data goes through China and all sorts of stuff like that. So, but for casual users like us, I think it's all right. Um, so I was amazed by this, especially from a security management point of view. So the Democratic governor of Kentucky has decided to quarantine anybody that goes to church on Easter and he has decided to send police to record the license plates of everybody going to church on Easter to stop this, even though every church or almost every church in his state has already canceled their services. So this is the classic um, overreach of a security person making trouble. This is almost certainly unconstitutional. It's going to get people really mad. It's violating the separation of church and state, I think. It's, this is madness. He's going to get so much anger from this for a very small benefit of stopping probably the future services. I can see how you might say they got to stop them all, but, but I wouldn't have, uh, I would have just strongly recommended it, but not sent police out to record the license plates if it was me, because this is, uh, this is certainly going to lead to a backlash. Anyway, so a lot of people are excited about COBOL um, because the, the governor of New Jersey came out and said he really needs COBOL programmers to help fight the coronavirus somehow. And uh, this brought a new level of awareness of the fact that everything is built really using COBOL. So um, many people are, 95% of all uh, ATM transactions use COBOL. Uh, COBOL was the second computer language, I think. The first was Fortran and COBOL was the second, generally computer language. It was very soon thereafter, written in 1959. And there's now getting an interest in teaching COBOL again. I wrote a CTF, you can do it for extra credit. But anyway, uh, so Burning Man got canceled. It's gonna be a virtual event. The airport uh, got hacked to some extent. It didn't sound too serious, but they installed code on their website that stole some uh, passwords from, I think their employees, I guess. And so it sounds like that's so a major card infection. They managed to add some kind of malware to their site. It's crazy things always happen in Florida. So this woman, distributed Easter eggs to random homes full of pornography. She's on some kind of crusade and somehow feels that this is benefiting people and ended up in trouble because she was violating a uh, coronavirus lockdown to do this. So stuff like that always seems to come out of Florida. Hexrays makes Ida Pro and Ida Pro is really expensive and now they have a home version which is only like $300. So um, I think for what we're doing, we can just, we're going to use either the free version that's really old, and uh, we'll, I think we'll use Gidra more, if I can get around to writing that stuff. Um, I don't know. I think paying, I don't recommend paying for IDA, but apparently some people are going to do it. IDA is the standard static analysis tool, but it's pretty big and hard to use, and I think Gidra is easier for a level of what we're doing. Anyway. Apple and Google have partnered to create an API for both Android and iOS, which will hopefully let people track their coronavirus exposure. And the idea is your phone has an anonymous number like a cookie, and when you pass other phones, it trades it with Bluetooth. So each phone has a local copy of a list of all the phones you've been near in the last couple of weeks. And if somebody takes, gets coronavirus and takes a test, then their number is flagged somehow and then all the phones eventually find out if they have that number in their list and so you're told you were exposed by being close to somebody with coronavirus supposedly it is anonymous there's no way to trace it back to you it's not tied to your geographical location and the data never goes to the government or anything but all that's happened so far is apple and google have agreed to write sort of the technological API for this, and they're leaving it to government to write an app. So we don't know all the details, but this is certainly an interesting issue. Uh, and I think it'll be hard for us to ever open up the economy and stop this shutdown without some kind of tracing like this. So we do need some other way of limiting the spread of the virus than keeping everybody locked up for the next year and a half. And there won't be any vaccine for a year and a half. So perhaps this will be part of the solution. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, so IBM has announced that they're going to have COBOL skills, and they've announced they're going to have a free COBOL class, which caught my attention. So I went to look at the COBOL class, and when I looked at it early this morning, 
there was nothing here at all, but seven hours ago, they updated enough to put the license here, but nothing else. So I contacted them and say, and they've already had several articles come out and say, they've got a free course, you can take the course. And when you go there, this is the course. And I'm like, dude, I don't, I'm not very happy with their course here. So I told them, I think they, if it's IBM, they probably have some plans, but I told them, anyway, I wrote my course, which is what you can do for extra credit, which is down here, the COBOL CTF, and I'm gonna be doing it at Pacific Hackers meeting. So we're up to the official time for this course. Let me talk about our schedule because this is in fact affecting our schedule. So here we are um, down here, had a couple canceled classes. And so I decided to, I did a lecture on, on 64 bit assembly last time, but the students couldn't get in because Zoom had put a password on and I didn't know that. So it's a video, hopefully you've already watched it. And um, then I'm doing the first part of chapter eight today, the next part next week. I was, um, and then the specific hackers, which is the um, South Bay um, hacking group that I think is very good. They're having a bunch of online events and they're worth extra credit if you go to them and they are, are very close to the time of this class. This class is at one. So in the 18th, which is next week, um, if we finish in an hour, which we probably will, you could go to this thing afterwards. The week after that, I'm gonna move this class to an hour earlier at noon, because the Pacific Hackers event is very useful, OWASP top 10, and it starts at one. So I'm moving this class to an hour earlier. And again, of course, it'll all be videotaped and put on the internet, so uh, in YouTube. So if you can't make it to the actual time, you'll still be able to watch the video. And the week after that, I'm gonna do the COBOL CTF at Pacific Hackers. It's, these are all online events. And um, anyway, so I'll present that at two. So anyway, um, they have a lot of events down there and they look pretty good. So um, I'll just make sure you know, in two weeks, this class will be an hour earlier. That's the most direct effect on this class. All right, we're checking. Okay, I've got to see the chat rooms, chat messages are there. Okay, so uh, that being said, let's take a look at the Windows information. I'm doing just the first chapter because as Deborah was pointing out, this is pretty dense stuff. This Windows stuff gets confusing because Windows is so secure. Windows had so many security problems, they had to put on layers and layers and layers of security defenses until it got very big and complicated, and that's where we're at. It's funny, I'm trying to make things nice and big because the video lowers the resolution. All right, so we're gonna talk about the thread environment block, and process environment block, stack overflows, ASLR, frame-based exception handlers, and exception handler protections. So a, um, if a currently executing thread on a Windows machine has a block which has information such as where the memory segments are, and uh, like many things, this is somewhat undocumented, but in fact, as we've talked about, you can easily view the kernel in Windows machines so they can't really hide anything for long. So you can get a lot of pro information about a process from here. You can get the address table and the startup arguments and more here. And one of the things you can get here is the pointer to the SEH frame. And as we're gonna see, the structured exception handler is very important to us. It's one, ask, one area for exploiting the machine. So now, by the way, there are these things called segment registers in the processor. They're left over. I think these were all the way back in 8-bit, maybe 16-bit processors. Uh, these were supposed to point to areas of memory, and as far as I can tell, they don't do much, but FS does in fact point to the, the thread execution block. Anyway, so the process execution environment block is another data structure um, used by NT internally, and again, intended for internal use, um, but a few fields are uh, documented. They'll tell you whether your process is being debugged and something about the parameters and the session ID and so on. So there's some information there that might be useful. <coughs> but down to uh, more familiar territory is our buffer overflows. We've talked about this. The standard buffer overflow looks like this. You have a variable like name and you're able to write past the end of it. So you write um, past all this junk and you carefully target the stored return pointer. So now you control the instruction pointer and you Call it, you put it a number in the instruction pointer that jumps back into part of the code you executed, which has got an ops and then it's got an egg. So this is the basic buffer overflow that we've been doing. And so the Microsoft defenses are designed to break that process. 
Now, with the structured exception handle exploit, you do pretty much the same thing. You, the structured exception handler handles errors. So when the code crashes in some way, raising an exception, it tries your exception handlers in your program to see if you, the coder, the developer of the program, planned for this exception and planned to handle it somehow. First, it gives your program a chance to handle the error. If your program does not handle it, it becomes an unhandled exception, and then it goes to the operating system, which will do something like pop up Dr. Watson or something like that, some kind of error message. So in the first place it goes is the exception handler. And if we are able to alter the exception handler, we can take it over. And so if that happens, if I can hit the exception handler and then cause an exception, so there's two steps, really. I have to first um, overwrite the exception handler, and then I have to do something that causes an exception. Often you can do both of those with the buffer overflow. And so basically, I then get to put a address here, which is going to an exception handler. The only And it has the same result. I can now go back and run the code I injected in the egg. The only difference is, instead of hitting a returned instruction pointer, so the uh, operating system thinks it is returning from a subroutine. I put it in an exception handler. The operating system thinks it is handling exception, but the end result is the same. I control the instruction pointer and I can point it back to code I injected. So the defenses to stop this are pretty powerful. Address space layout randomization is the simplest one. Instead of everything just being lined up in memory, starting at low memory and the next one and the next, it randomizes them every time you restart your machine. So I don't know where I am at all. And so I cannot find those addresses to put in. So uh, I have to do it indirectly. So the simplest one is a trampoline. You find a jump ESP, which is a very common range of instructions. And you find a jump ESP in a module that doesn't have ASLR turned on, which is sort of annoying. I mean, ASLR sounds very powerful, but not every function is in fact randomized, which is kind of rude. So you just have to find this in an address that you can find, jump there, and then it will jump back to ESP, and that will point to somewhere on the stack, and you have a pretty good chance of being able to control the data there. If you're gonna use the structured exception handler, old Windows versions actually always left the instruction, the address of the SEH in the register, EBX. So you could just find a jump EBX, and that would go to the instruction handler, um, but newer versions clear that. However, the SEH address is related to the ESP. So a jump ESP won't take you there, but a pop pop return will take you there, which is the same thing as a pop pop jump ESP. And we'll see this in the live demonstration later. Um, two layers, two records down in the stack is the pointer that you need. All right, so um, exception handlers are codes that deal with errors like this. And these things are called frame-based exception handlers. Every thread has at least one exception handler. And it looks like this. You have uh, the address of the first exception handler, and then a pointer to the next address, the next structure, the next structure. You just have a whole series of addresses here. Try this routine and see if it will handle the problem. If it does not handle it, then try this one, then try this one. And after that, it's unhandled. And we just send it off to the operating system to do whatever it wants to do about it. The exception handler would just be code like this. In comes the exception handler. It will now, um, in this one, will just tell you it's in the handler and then return. A real exception handler would now print up an informative error message to the user, um, perhaps somehow fix the problem and so on. So you can view the SEH chain in immunity. And uh, if you do it, you'll just see a series of hands, of, um, uh, addresses here, these are all in NTDIL. This is Microsoft's exception handler for Notepad. So there are three routines that are tried in order, these two appear to be the same, to handle exceptions. Um, so you can follow an address in the stack. Um, you'll see a pointer here to the next SEH record and the end of the SEH chain. So what I've done there here is um, D9FF. Yeah, down here, this is D9FF. D9, FE, CC, and if you follow it in the stack, you'll see the pointer here, the SE handler, and then more pointers down there. So this is the code that does it. All right, so if you overflow the stack, hit the return address, you've caused some collateral damage, and it's often true that you will cause an exception because you've broken other things. Um, all right, 
So if you want to gain control of these things, um, EBX could help you find it. On later versions, you couldn't. Um, so at a crash, EBX would point to it. You could just put a jump EBX there, and you'd get back in that structure. In modern Windows processes, um, it's the third value that points to the exception handler, which we're going to use. So you need pop, pop, return. So it amounts to about the same thing. So Microsoft added some protections, and this is part of Microsoft's new being friendly to hackers policy. They used to, in the days of Windows 95 and Windows 98, just say hackers should be locked up and they should just shut up and they shouldn't tell anybody about this stuff. But they got over that, and now they, um, they have a blue hat contest where they will invite hackers to come find the holes in the product. And if you find a good hole in Windows, they'll pay you $100,000. And if you write a defense that stops that attack, they'll give you another $100,000. And that has greatly improved the security of Windows. And every version now has a bunch of carefully written defenses to stop these attacks. So Windows 2003 server tried to make sure that the exception handler was not corrupt. So it wouldn't let the handler be on the stack. It wouldn't let it be in any loaded EXEs or DILs, or at least sometimes it would. Sometimes it wouldn't. You could mark it as not allowed. So a, a module couldn't have an exception handler in it. And um, if it didn't have certain other parameters uh, or certain other uh, limitations are there. So I've hit the wrong button here. All right. Anyway, um, it turns out that you can still exploit it by using the existing handler using code outside the modules or code in a module that doesn't have a load configuration directory so like most microsoft defenses it there were some pretty obvious ways to work around it so in server 2008 microsoft added more defenses now a normal structured exception handler attack looks like this you have a legitimate handler here the application tries this module to handle the exception then the kernel tries something, then NTDL tries something, then you give up. Um, the, the end is marked. So here, I added, a, I changed the address to a handler to point to a pop pop return. Then when an exception occurs, it'll jump to a point pop return, and I will gain control of the machine. So Microsoft added safe SEH in Visual Studio 2003, so you can compile your code with this extra switch, and then, it will list all the real exception handler addresses somewhere in the code, and it will not let any exception handler be altered to point to some address not on the allowed list. So that sounds really pretty good, but it's not going to affect legacy code, and it's not going to affect any new code that is compiled without turning on that switch. Another one is SE Hop, and this, by the way, is very similar to Cisco's check keeps. This verifies that the exception handler is intact. Um, Normally, when you inject code onto the exception handler, it's structured like a list. There's an address to a handler and then an address to the next record. And if you just sloppily overrun it with like a buffer overflow, you will damage the pointers to the next record. So you won't be able to hop to the end of the chain anymore. So here's the, the point of the record. So what you do is it adds an extra record to the end of the list, which is exactly what check heaps does, and it hops down the list. Here's the first record. Here's the pointer to the next record. Check here, pointer to the next record. It goes to the end and make sure that it made it to the expected place so that all the pointers are intact. Um, this is a simple test and it will detect if someone has corrupted it. All right, so here's a valid chain. Try this. And if that doesn't work, go to the pointer to the next record and try that, pointer to the next record and try that. But if a hacker has corrupted the next record, then you this won't, reach the final record, and so it will detect that the exception chain is corrupt. This is now enabled by default in Windows Server 2008. Um, typically, most Microsoft advanced security features are enabled on servers, but disabled on clients because servers are more important. Many people share them, and they have a lot of high-value data, and it is generally considered acceptable to force people that have servers to have relatively new hardware and to use new versions of products on the server. But clients are the opposite. They typically only have one person's data on it. And users probably want to use old legacy software and perhaps run it on old hardware and so on. So Microsoft typically turns off most of the um, defenses that break old code by default on client operating systems. All right. 
you can control it with this disable exception chain validation uh, record. All right. And uh, if you do, then when you try to corrupt the exception handler, it will halt and say debug program is unable to process exception. That means SE Hawk caught you trying to mess with the exception handler. All right. So I've got a few cahoots, and I think I'll do the um, ones from last week first. Uh, I didn't get to do the cahoots last week because the students couldn't get in. I got some 64-bit cahoots. Let's see how you like those, and then I'll do the Windows cahoots. But we got the Chapter 7 left over from last week. So those of you that watched the video may be well positioned to win at these cahoots. See how many students I have. Ah, six, good. Maybe enough to make a reasonable group competition here. Oops, I wanted to make. Uh... Yeah, I don't know. Oh, well, I guess that'll do. Well, we're not going to have much fun if we don't get at least a couple more people in the cahoots. Rich is a likely cahooter. Well, I'll give it a few more seconds, but if you only have two, I'm not going to do them. Ah, good. Well, we're up to three. Let's see if we can get four. Ah, oh, good. Ah, oh, now we're getting somewhere. All right. That's pretty good. I doubt we're going to get any more. If anybody's still coming, put a message in the chat. Otherwise, in about five seconds, we'll take off. All right. So. How many bits in AL? Eight bits. EAX is sixteen bits. AL refers to the lower eight bits. All right. How many bits in RAX? That's 64. EAX is 32. RAX is 64. All right. If you don't have a 64-bit add immediate command, how can you accomplish that? Two commands. This is generally the case, and when we get into ARM later, you'll see this. You, you can, of course, do anything, but it might take several commands. All right. How many bits? does Windows use for addressing on 64 bits, 64 bit processor? 48, this is kind of a swindle. It does not use all 64 bits for addressing. It uses only 48, which is enough to address all the amount of RAM you can afford right now, but it's a little bit sloppy. So I got poet, I don't know who that is, but my grader might know. Elam is a real name. And that's rich, I think. All right. So that's good. All right. So let's do another one of these about today's lecture. That may go a little better. All right. This was 8A, what we just did. So 
see how you like this one. I think that's all we had last time. All right. So, which method only works on really old machines? Dump EBX. When it put a, the data in the register after an exception, the address, the handler. Which one is enabled in servers but disabled in clients? See hop. Okay, which one can be enabled individually for each process in Windows 7? That's also SE Hop. You can turn it on and off process by process. All right, where's the register pointing to the thread environment block? Like the thread execution block. Okay, that's the FS is the register. Good. Frame segment or something like that. All right. Which defense cannot protect legacy code? Safe SEH. The rest of these are overall operating system things which can protect old code, but safe SEH must be specified when the code is compiled. So you would at the very least have to recompile old code. Basically, you have to update it. All right. Which method will defeat ASLR for Stack Overflows? Pop, pop, return. That's the one that does it. All right. So we've got Amparo. Good. And Rich again. I think R is Rich. I'm going with that unless I hear otherwise. Elan. Good. All right. So. All right. So the last thing I want to do is just demonstrate the uh, SEH export, which I've got set up to go here. So let me uh, bring it up here. This project is the SEH exploit on Windows right here, um, 319. So before I have got a Windows machine here, let me bring it up, although it's pretty simple what's going on with my Windows machine. Here, come on, okay. Here's my Windows machine and, oops, not that. In fact, let's get rid of that. All right, here's my Windows machine. So I've got um, vulnerable server running as usual, and I've turned off a couple of defenses here. I'll just point to it in the project. I turned off data execution prevention. This um, turns it on for everything except things in the whitelist. This turns it on only for essential Windows programs only. I could have, I suppose, just whitelisted phone server, but here I set it up to the first option here. Because since we're using a server operating system, it's set in the more secure mode. If we were working on a client operating system, this would be the default. And then I turned off SE hop, which is another defense uh, that blocks this attack by 
maintaining the integrity. So I go into the kernel and disable exception change validation. So that gets rid of SE hop. And after you make those changes and restart your machine, your server machine is now down to the security level, more like a client machine. All right. And so you run your vulnerable server, turn off the firewall, find its IP address, and then you can connect, which I've done all that. So here's a DOS exploit that will send Gmon and then an attack. And the attack is just going to be about 4,000 A's with some X's and BCDE. So I've skipped over the first few steps that we practiced before, where you fuzz it by sending longer and longer things until it crashes. And then you send a non-repeating block of characters to find out exactly where the crash is. I've gone ahead and told, let you know where the crash is. It's there, he's here, 35, 35 A's. And uh, after 3,535 characters, then you put BCDE. So if I start my server here, I'm gonna close it here and close the debugger for right now. If I just run the server right from the downloads folder in my Vuln server and run it here, it starts listening. So that's listening. And if I now send my attack, I've got a Kali machine running and I've connected with SSH. So I've got it right here. And I make this bigger because I know the, the font gets pretty small in the video. All right. So the first one here is SEH1. If I look at the code, SEH1, all this is doing, make it even bigger. All this code is doing is connecting to my server. Let me move it. Okay. On, on this IP address, which is the service address and that port. And then it sends 3,535 A's and then BCDE and then enough X's to get a total of 4,000 bytes. So if I run that, it crashes and the operating system posts this message. So this is an unhandled exception. It caused an exception in the program. Then it tried to go through the program's internal error handling, which failed. And it dumped it off to the server operating system, which popped up this box now offering to close the program for me. So that's what happened. So to see what's going on in more detail, we got to use a debugger. So we open the debugger and connect to Vuln server and then run it and then run it again because it's 32-bit code and we have to run it twice to get it going in the debugger on a 64-bit system. And now I'll just send the same attack again. And when I do, it pauses with an access violation. So the first thing my attack did was cause an exception. And the debugger stops when there's an exception to give you a chance to examine the code. If you want to pass the exception to the program to see if the exception handler works, then you use these commands. And I'm going to use Shift F9 to resume execution. And now it crashes with BCDE. So that was informative. Now I, we can view the exception handler here. And you can see what happened. The first record in the exception handler does point to real part of the uh, NT. But the next one is BCDE. So it tried to handle the exception. This exception handler didn't do it. Then it tried to go to the next record and this blocked it. And by the way, notice that up here are some of the A's we fed in. So that's why SE hop would have saved us because SE hop would try to use these pointers and go through these records sequentially. And when it hit this, it would notice that this exception handler has been corrupted and it would refuse to accept it. But since we turned off SE hop, our machine is now vulnerable. So let's restart it again. And now we've just got to exploit that. So notice we get an exception. When we handle the exception, we now try to execute code here. So we now control the um, instruction pointer. So the next one is SEH2. So here, what I'm gonna do is instead of sending uh, 3535, I'm gonna send less and I'm gonna put some code here. Knock, 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 break. 90 is knock and CC is break. Then I'm going to have a pivot. Now the pivot point is going to have to overcome address space layout randomization. So let's figure out how to do that. Let me send the old, in fact, I think I've still got it set here. Notice something here. 
uh, let me go back to my instructions and talk about planning the exploit. So now we have a DOS exploit. All right. So we observe the SEH chain and we've observed the exception handling. Um, all right. Now we want to look at the stack pane, which I think I can't do right now, so I'm going to have to do it again. Debug, restart. Yes. Run and run. Okay. And now I send SEH1 again. All right. And now notice what's going on here. Here I am at the point of the exception, and this is the stack. This is the address, E0, the next stack record, the next stack record. These are the contents. This points to code. Remember that execution will, executable code always thinks it's at 400,000. So this is part of my Vuln server process. This is a return pointer. And this pointer points back to the characters I actually sent in, Gmon and all that. So let me go back to here. All right. Um, I want to go ahead to the access violation and then look here and we'll see how that changes. So if I pass the exception to the program with shift F9, now this is the point where it actually crashes trying to use the injected code. And now notice that this pointer is pointing somewhere. This is garbage. And this one points to AAA BCDE. So this is the address that ends up in EIP. So I am pointing to four bytes before that. So I, if I can find a pop pop return, I can jump to this byte, which is four bytes before what I just handled. So this means I can find code I inject and I can inject code, but I can only inject four bytes of code. So what can you do with four bytes of code? Well, you have to consider a little assembler. So I can find a pop pop return. And we can do that the way we've done it before by just using mono modules. But if we do, we're going to have to build something with only four bytes. So right now, let's just do the part where you find the modules. Um, if you go to bang mono modules, it'll show you the modules in the code and you'll see the defenses. And we want something that doesn't move. So the ones with ASLR turned on are pretty much useless to us because even if they have a pop-pop return, we can't find it. The only ones without ASLR are ESS Funk and Vuln Server itself. Vuln Server itself is, of course, loaded at 400,000 hex, where it always is. So all the addresses in Vuln Server start with null bytes, and that's no good for an exploit that involves injecting strings. So the only one we can use is this one here, ESS Funk not dill, with addresses starting at 6250. So we need to find pop pop return in there and the mona command to do that is this one mona rop that'll find rops in there so when you run that one it finds them and they end up down here i don't think i'll bother doing it live you have a series of them it found a whole bunch of them and one of them is at 625010 b4 so that is a pop pop return in the module it doesn't move so that's the address to inject so Let's go back to this SEH2. That is what this address is. 625010B4 is here. 625010B4 backwards. That's the pivot. So I send a prefix, then I send my shell, then a pivot, and then the a post characters to bring the total back to 4,000. The pivot is the address I injected, which is going to go in the instruction pointer. It's going to jump to this address. Then it's going to do pop, pop, return, which is going to jump four bytes back. And here, what I'm putting in for shell code is not, not, not break. I just want to see if I can run, execute that code. So that's what this one does. So let's restart it. I go back to the CPU window and debug restart. Now it's loaded. Now I run and run again, and now I send that one up, SEH2. It causes an access violation exception. I have to pass that to the program with Shift F9. Now, it doesn't crash with ABCD anymore. 
it moves back to here. And if I roll up a little, I can see that it works. It met up and did the knock, 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 int. And this stuff here that it's calling move and push and bound, this is really just the address 6250.10b4. That's the address I injected. So I was able to inject an address which went to a pop pop return, which jumped four bytes back and then executed not 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 int. So I have gained code execution, but my code execution is only four bytes long. Uh, by the way, I should mention, um, you know, I wonder what you can do with four bytes. Well, uh, check rain, Tom, one of my students did this. He made check rain and he, what he did was he found a defect in the iPhone bootloader that let him control one write operation where he could write one byte and that byte had to be zero. And I said, I don't know what you can do with that. And he took over the whole phone with that. So, you know, you can accomplish a lot with a very weak weapon if you're clever enough. So we can now run code that is four bytes long. So in order to take over a machine with four bytes long code, we have to make a short instruction that jumps somewhere else. And that turns out to be pretty easy. So um, now we have that. And so we have to look at these jump instructions. Here's jump relative eight, jump relative 16, and so on. Um, anyway, it turns out that the jump rel 16 is only available if you have a 32-bit hardware processor running in 16-bit mode. So the only one we can use is, um, this is five bytes long. Um, so we could put shell code after it and it can, uh -huh. First three are relative jumps. Second item. Okay, these are the relative jumps. So we're gonna have to use this one, jump rel 16. That is the one that's gonna be, a, no? All right, I've lost my mind here. We'll see which one we use. I forgot which one I actually ended up using. I'm following somebody else's tutorial and now I don't remember it. Um, so we have to figure out where to put the shell code also. Ah, uh, this is why, jump rel eight. I think jump rel eight is what we're gonna use. This one runs, but it can only move 128 bytes. All right, so anyway, we have to find somewhere to put the code. And um, after considering various options, here's the winning strategy. You put the shell code before the SEH bytes, inject pop pop return, and now up here you use a jump rel eight because that is short and you move back 10 bytes and that's enough to put a jump rel 32. So it's a little bit confusing, but that's what we've got here. So if I look at my SEH3, that's what's going on here. So I have the pivot, which will jump back four bytes and execute the jump eight. And then that will jump back a bigger distance and take me to here. And that will let me jump back 450 bytes so I can put shell code back there. So what I've made here is a dummy exploit just to see if it's gonna work. So I put in the pivot, it jumps back four bytes and executes a not break. So I'll see it stop. Then when I let it continue, this is the one that jumps back some larger distance to take me back here where again, I have a fake not not break. So I can see that it's executing. This is the command that jumps back a greater distance, jumping back into the buffer that's all breakpoints. So I'll see several breakpoints when I run this one but I'll be able to see that the exploit is working. So I restart this again, debug, restart, and run and run. And when I send in SEH3, again, I have the access violation. That's the fundamental exception. When I pass that in with Shift F9, it moves, okay, it injected the 6250.10b4, it jumped back four bytes and did not int three. Now it's going to do a jump short back to FFC6 up here. So when I continue again with shift F7, we'll do the next, that's going to jump back. Um, just F7 there. Now it's going to go up here and hit this interrupt and stop again. So um, I think F9 will do just to resume. So now it's going to jump back even further, 109 FE0A. And if I want to see where FE0A is, it's back here, FE. All right, 
Stop asking about me. F D. There. F E zero A is around here. And as you can see, it's part of this block of int threes. So if I continue with F9, it's going to go back to the jump and I hit F9 again. It's going to jump back there. So I was able to do a small jump, a bigger jump, and end up way back in that big block of code. So now I can make the final exploit, which is going to just be this one. And let me make my window bigger. And we'll do um, nano SEH4. All right. So first I just connect to the socket on the same old network. Then I put in a whole Metasploit shell code I put in here from MSF uh, payload, or MSF Venom. And now here's just the same injection. This is the trampoline that jumps to uh, back, jumps to a location that'll take me back here, four bytes back. This is the small jump that takes me back a few bytes, just enough to execute a five byte command that'll jump back 450 bytes. And that'll jump me back up here into the NOP sled before this buffer. So here's my NOP sled. So my exploit now has a prefix, a NOP sled, a buffer, two jumps, and a pivot, and then enough of a post. So that'll do it. And uh, this is a reverse shell. So I have to send it here. Let's do debug, restart, and then run and run, and then send up SEH4. Okay, and it's going to hit the access violation. Now, I'm going to want to have a listener running. So let me go down to my, and to here, there we are, that MSF console. I don't need the sudo when I'm running on Kali. That's the code that will start my listener, because it's going to do a reverse interpreter shell to my Kali machine. Okay, so it's ready. And if I go to my Windows machine, it's now at the break. I have to do a Shift-9 to pass the exception. And this one is not running right away because I left some of these int threes in here just so I can see it work. So now it's done the trampoline and made it to the short jump. When I give it F9, it's going to go do the short jump, which takes it to the long jump. When I give it another F9, it's going to go back, and I put an int right before the start of the Metasploit shell code, so it just so I could see this, and another F9 will run the exploit, and as you can see, it's now running, and over here I got a Meterpreter shell opening, so as usual, I can do all the usual stuff that Meterpreter lets me do, um, and what is it? So uh, sysinfo tells me that I'm in fact in control of this Windows machine from my call. So, that's the whole story, um, and that's this one here to try out. And that runs on modern versions of Windows if you have turned off some of the fancier defenses that are not always turned on. So that's uh, relatively powerful. All right, and I think that's all I wanted to show you today. Um, I'm going to stop the uh, recording.